Well, so thanks a lot for, to the organizers for inviting me and uh, of course for organizing this wonderful meeting at a very beautiful intersection of topics involving combinatorics, uh, you know, algorithms and uh, physics. It's a very inspiring combination, so it's amazing to be uh, part of a meeting like this. Uh, so yes, yeah, so this is going to be about combinatorial topological quantum field theories and geometrical constructions of integers in finite group representation theory. So I'll, I'll tell you why we got thinking about this and a bit of the background, uh, but I'll kind of focus on the mathematics and uh, uh, just uh, because of the nature of this meeting. Uh, so it started with this paper on integrality, duality, and finiteness in combinatoric topological strings with these collaborators. Uh, and then another one, so these are all string theorists like myself, uh, and so is Eric, and we had a development on, on this. Uh, and I'll, you know, going from here to here actually has to do with going from digraph Witten to twist and digraph Witten. So <laughs> the kind of thing that Thomas was talking about before. Uh, and then this, there's an idea of duality, which is very prevalent in string theory. And we were exploring ideas of duality in this combinatorial context. So a, bit, a, bit, a little bit more concrete about what this all has to do with string theory, but it'll be very concrete stuff having to do with character tables. So uh, you know, topological quantum field theories uh, in the very simplest setup, uh, 2D surfaces, they uh, arise in physics, they are of interest in uh, string theory. Uh, and I will be looking at a class of topological quantum field theories which can be defined either using a tier's axioms, so associating interesting numbers to three whole spheres, one whole spheres and such, and then uh, associating numbers to these uh, surfaces in a way that uh, is compatible with certain axioms. Uh, that's one way to approach topological quantum field theories. And there is also a physical method where you start with a lati very simple lattice gauge theory. You just take a surface, discretize it, triangulate it, associate some group elements to all the edges, and then you just sum over the group elements, and there's a weight, one weight associated with each plaquette, which is a flatness condition. Simply that the product of group elements around the edges of a triangle or a polygon uh, is one. So a flatness condition, very simplest kind of topological quantum field theories. Uh, it's a, this is a very simple version of what is called digraph Witten 2D topological quantum field theory. So this kind of physical way of approaching it is, uh, you know, lattice gauge theory. It is defined by uh, triangulating the surface, putting some weights on the, some group elements on the edges, summing everything, and there is a plaquette or plaquette weight, plaquette weight, or associated with the two cells, and the weight is simply a delta function, the product of group elements uh, associated with the edges of the two cell. So very simple kind of topological quantum field theory studied back in the 90s. It acquired some interest recently because people were using, going back to two-dimensional quantum field theories, uh, topological quantum field theories, and as models of two-dimensional, uh, well, two-dimensional quantum gravity, and sort of summing over genuses, summing over topologies, uh, and there were motivations from uh, sort of wormhole physics to the quantum gravity, which was kind of inspiring people to revisit these things, and which is why we started looking at this again. But we kind of took this as an opportunity to look for what kind of interesting mathematical information can arise by looking at these very simple quantum field, topological quantum field theories, and do what you do in string theory, which is combine information from different genuses. This is one of the basic things about string theory. Uh, so we wanted to see what can happen when you do that. So these very simple topological quantum field theories, uh, they are defined on surfaces of arbitrary genus, the genus will be called uh, H because there will be a group called G. Uh, and uh, these expressions for the partition functions, the closed string partition function, can be written either as a sum of our group elements, which is close to this lattice gauge theory description, or the partition function on a closed surface can be written in terms of sums over irreducible representations, just by group theory manipulations. But somehow there's a lot of information, mathematical information, in comparing these two, e two equal things and exploring the implications of that comparison. Uh, and that's what I will talk about. Uh, 
And the mathematics that we will be connecting with is combinatorial representation theory, close to the theme of a lot that is being discussed here. So, so in combinatorial representation theory, we are interested in combinatorial constructions uh, of integer quantities arising in representation theory. So for example, you have you know, a finite group Sn, and you can define what you mean by a representation over C, uh, and you can classify them. But the answer has nothing to do with C. It's just a bunch of young diagrams with N boxes, purely combinatorial object. So uh, likewise, the dimensions of these EREPs, again, defined in representation theory as the dimension of the vector space, uh, well, you can have a very simple combinatorial formula, the hook formula, where there's a weight for every box uh, of the young diagram. And there are more sophisticated things like the Little Littlewood Richardson rule along the same lines. The two things like this, which I will play a role in this talk, is let's take this one. It's also something of a similar nature. There's something having to do with representation theory, which is the sum of squares of dimensions of all the irreducible representations of a finite group. And this famous identity says that that sum of squares is just the order of the group. So a finite set, you count how many elements in the set, and you've learned something without ever defining a representation of a C, you know, just working on this finite set of things, counting it, and, and getting this sum of squares. There's also the Burnside algorithm for irreducible characters for any finite group, uh, which again is something that uses the combinatorial data of group multiplications uh, to arrive at irreducible characters. And these are the two things that we will make contact with and that we will generalize. So what are we going to get out of this? Uh, we're going to look at the partition functions of these G flat TQFTs on surfaces. We're going to combine information from a range of genuses uh, in the spirit of string theory. And it will allow us to generalize these two constructions. So we're going to get interesting integers in representation theory uh, from combinatorial data without even ever invoking complex numbers, uh, just discrete algorithms from the discrete data. And we're going to produce all the dimensions of the finite uh, group irreducible representations. Uh, and uh, we're going to also learn along the process that there are interesting partial sums of characters along the columns of a character table. So the character table records along the rows the different irreducible representations along the columns, the different conjugacy classes. And there's a number there, which is the trace of the matrix representing a group element in that conjugacy class for the given representation and the given conjugacy class. So the rows are the irreducible representations and the columns are, are labeled by, so the rows are irreps, columns are conjugacy classes. So here, using this G flat TQFTs, we get uh, integrality conditions and partial sums of characters along columns of the character table. So fixed conjugacy class summing over irreducible representations for some subset, partial sums. Now, so then you can ask yourself, what if you wanted to learn about partial sums and get integrality conditions for rows of character tables? And then you remember a little uh, nice fact, a classical fact about sums of characters uh, over conjugacy classes. And that is related actually to a sum of fusion multiplicities uh, for that irreducible representation. When you take Vs, this is an irreducible representation S, you tensor it with itself. You can get Vr with some multiplicity. What is the dimension of that multiplicity? is the fusion coefficient for s tensor s going to r. And you sum them over s that is equal to uh, the sum of characters along uh, a row. So summing over all the conjugacy classes for fixed row. So to get row properties, one gets, one has to look at sort of uh, fusion coefficients. Now this itself looks a bit like a TQFT data, where the TQFT data is defined uh, using uh, fusion multiplicities. 
So indeed, one can define a TQFT this time axiomatically uh, based on fusion coefficients, and we're, we're going to call this G fusion TQFTs, and using analogous computations, which replace G flat TQFTs with G fusion TQFTs, we're going to get similar integrality results for partial row sums uh, of character tables. So that's the plan. So first of all, how do we use G flat TQFT to obtain the dimensions? How to make contact with the Burnside algorithm? Uh, and then uh, integrality of columns, partial sums along columns and rows. So this G flat TQFT, uh, you know, you, it's a topological quantum field theory. If you have a genus H surface, you can realize this as a polygon uh, with uh, two H sides and some identifications. And uh, you, uh, as a result, derive a formula for the partition function, which is simply a sum over these two H tuples of group elements. And this is the con commutator, it's G1, G2, G1 inverse, G2 inverse. And this is a delta function. It says that this product of group elements you see here, uh, if, if that product is one, the delta function will give you one. If that product is not one, the delta function will give you zero. So you just sum over tuples satisfying this condition, that their product of these commutators is one. So very combinatorial counting. Just take group elements, multiply them, uh, and uh, you count, you get a number. This is also equal to the sum of irreducible representations of the order of the group divided by the dimension of the irreducible representation R raised to the power 2h minus 2, where h is, again, the genus, the number of handles in the surface. So the left-hand side is combinatorial. Uh, and uh, the right-hand side gives a power sum of dimensions dr. Sorry? Oh, delta. So, so the delta of a group element, so it's defined for any group element, is equal to 1 if g is the identity, and it is 0 if g is not the identity. So it's a delta function over the group element, over the group or the group algebra, because it's a sum of group elements here. So likewise, if I have a sum of group elements, uh, it will pick up the coefficient. Uh, great. So now, uh, special case of that formula is that if you take uh, h equals 0, uh, what happens, h equals 0, well, let me not stare at this too, too hard, but this is what happens. You, you get 2h, uh, uh, well, the, the, the right-hand side is easy, uh, 2h minus 2, uh, and you get uh, h0, so dr square over g square. And the left-hand side, there is uh, essentially the number of group elements depends on the number of handles, so there's no group element. Uh, so you get 1 over g. So uh, that's uh, kind of the partition function which is consistent with all the gluing relations and everything. So this uh, uh, equation, g, is sum over dr square, follows as a special case. And a uh, very interesting thing that will play a role here is that actually, this I didn't know <laughs> before this project, is that g over dr are actually integers. And this follows from facts from finite group representation theories. The dimension of any irreducible representation divides the order of the group. So this is a well-known thing, but we, f we will find it useful. So we, we are going to therefore think about these integers. Uh, I'm going to call it AR. And we're going to consider these partition functions. For genus 2, I'm going to get AR square. Genus 3, AR to the 4. Uh, up to, it'll be useful to think about up to genus k plus 1, where I get these power sums of these ARs. So AR square, AR square square, and so on. So essentially, you are given these integers, and you know their power sum, and you want to reconstruct the integers. And this is combinatorial data that you can use. 
And so that's, that's a kind of a known thing one can do just to describe what it is. You can think about a matrix, uh, which is a diagonal matrix, which contains all these integers of interest. Uh, and what you do know, so a priori you don't know these integers, uh, but you know trace x is the sum of a square, trace x square is the sum of a r to the 4, and so on. So basically these uh, things that you see here are uh, these uh, power sums. And you want to use these power sums to find these integers. So it's useful to think about this polynomial in a new variable x that you introduce. Uh, so determinant of little x minus big x. So that's going to be x minus a1 square, x minus a2 square up to x minus ak square, where k is the number of a's, the number of conjugacy classes, or the number of e reps. And if you think about what this, you expand these powers of this indeterminate here. Uh, the leading power is going to be trace x. So leading by x to the k, if I reduce it by 1, then I'm going to get the sum of the a's. The next one, I'm going to get these elementary symmetric polynomials, which have a known expansion in terms of traces. So here's a polynomial. I can build it. I know the traces from combinatorial data. I therefore know this polynomial. And therefore, all I have to do is find the zeros of that polynomial. And I also know that uh, these a's are integers. So if I take this polynomial, I, these elementary symmetrics, I have redefined them with a sign and just write it without signs here. I also know that if I put x equals 0, all these terms go away. I just get the determinant. And the determinant is the product of these guys. So basically, these numbers I'm looking for will be divisors of det x. So I'm going to look among the divisors of det x, which has been constructed combinatorially because it's a sum of traces, and I know the traces from TQFT. Uh, I can also make it a bit more efficient, uh, take this determinant, uh, that's the evaluate at x equals 0. I could also evaluate it at x equals 1. Um, then I will get this polynomial, uh, this product is AR squared minus 1. That's something I can evaluate it at x. Um, and if I look at the set of divisors of that guy, uh, you know, shifted up by 1, they will be the AR square again. So I, they are called this div 1, the set of divisors of this quantity evaluated at 1 and then shifted by 1. So the set of numbers I'm looking for, this finite set, is intersection of div 0. And similar things, I can divide, define div 1, div 2 by evaluating at different integer values. And these are going to be among there. So I just have to search in this intersection, and then uh, uh, we look for k integers. And uh, basically, so we, we show in, in the paper that uh, once you, you search among these devices and you make sure that those devices satisfy these correct, correct product relations, then that actually determines these uh, A's. So, so that's a slightly slightly technical thing, we, we do that in the paper, in the first paper. So I hope that's pretty plausible. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. So that, that's the idea, you know, you, you reproduce, you take the trace of these uh, partition functions, uh, which are these traces, and then uh, you produce this polynomial, you evaluate the different inter integer values, look at the devices, look at the intersection, uh, and you recover these integers, which are g over dr, which are the which gives you once you know g the dimensions of all the ereps. So that's the first step: how we use the partition functions to get the dimensions of the ereps. Now we look at the partition functions for surfaces uh, with boundary, and the natural kind of thing you can do: uh, you know, you have some surface triangulate. And then on edges, so your, let's say, edges will include these things. And then you can associate group elements. You'll be associated group elements here with, uh, to these edges, which are at the boundary and edges inside. But you constrain the edges at the boundary to be in some conjugacy classes. That's a, an observable that you have natural in this theory. And then you compute the partition functions. So we're going to be, these, all these partition functions are expressible nicely in terms of the group algebra of the group. 
So in the group algebra, and in particular in terms of the center of the group algebra. So given any conjugacy class, which I call P, if you, let's say this is the size, the number of elements in the conjugacy class, if you take the sum of group elements in that conjugacy class, this is central, it commutes with everything in the group. Uh, you can take the, what will be useful in these partition functions is the, this normalized, peculiar kind of normalized character, where you take the character of a group element in that conjugacy class times the size of the conjugacy class divided by the dimension of the irrep. Sometimes it's called a normalized central character. It's the character of that guy divided by the dimension. That, that plays a role in the partition functions. Uh, so this set of elements, one for every conjugacy class, forms a basis for the center. And there is another basis for the center given by projectors, uh, labeled by irreducible representations, where you sum over all group elements weighted by characters. So these are two interesting bases. And uh, this projector basis, these are orthogonal projectors. They satisfy the usual projector, orthogonal projector equation. And what is also useful is that if you take this conjugacy class central element, you multiply it by the projector, you get back the projector with precisely this normalized character, the one I defined. Uh, and also, so what is going on is multiplication in the center of the group algebra. And if you multiply in this conjugacy class basis, you get a matrix. T, T, P, T, Q is C, P, Q, R, some structure constants of this center in this conjugacy class basis. And these structure constants are integers. That, that's also important. The, these are integers. So therefore, these are the, you know, so the operation of left multiplication by T, P, or multiplication by T, P, that operation has these matrix elements. The eigenvalues of these matrix elements once you know the eigenvectors, you know. So the eigenvalues of this matrix, think of this as a matrix CP, matrix elements QR, the eigenvalues of this are these normalized characters. Uh, and this is an integer matrix. And that has an implication that these normalized characters are actually uh, algebraic integers. So they satisfy a nice uh, eigenvalue equation, which has lambda to the n plus lower powers, all with integer coefficients. So it's an algebraic integer. So that will play a role. So these, these are algebraic integers. OK, great. So a standard result in G flat TQFT is that if you take uh, genus H with R distinct boundaries, you can put arbitrary conjugacy classes. But let's put a fixed one, uh, TP. You get these powers. You're going to get this power of uh, G over DR, which depends on the genus. Again, it's and, and there's a formula which is completely combinatorial, where you have sums of a group elements in that conjugacy class, and then you have something having to do with the handles, and then you take a delta function. So again, this is completely combinatorial. And then if I take h equals 1, uh, there, at, that simplifies. There's just this thing here, and this sum over characters simplifies. There's no g over dr. There's just these power sums. So now you have power sums of these normalized characters, and there's combinatorial data on the right-hand side. So like we did before, once you have all the power sums, you can reconstruct the, uh, these numbers. And this is exactly what the Burnside algorithm does. It just uh, constructs, uh, uh, essentially, uh, using the group data, uh, it essentially does that. Well, it's phrased slightly differently. But it's essentially the same. The way it's usually phrased is that you are looking at the structure constants of multiplication of, uh, by conjugacy class P. So TP multiply the group elements, and then you get these structure constants, which is in this TQFT associated with PQR. And then trace of that matrix CP is this thing with these guys identified. Trace of C square is two of these glued together and then with this identification. So in general, we're using that, which is exactly what I was just talking about. Uh, some number of uh, boundaries labeled by conjugacy class P uh, with one handle. So that's exactly the Burnside algorithm. Great. So that's kind of known, well-known stuff, uh, just slightly interpreted in terms of geometry here. 
Now, for the Burnside algorithm, we used genus 1 with general number of boundaries labeled by some conjugacy class of interest. So natural to ask, what happens if I take just one boundary labeled by CP and any number of uh, handles? Actually, this is the type where the one I want to think about first is just think about just CP here, any number of handles. You could also think about CP and then genus 1 and then any number of another conjugacy class. I'll do that later. First, I'll just take CP, one CP, any number of handles. So what information do we get out of that? So because we're thinking about any number of handles, it's useful uh, to think about there's a natural handle creation operator in this TQFT. So uh, it's basically this commutator summed over G and H. It should be G and H inside the group, and you have that. And this handle creation operator has an expansion in these projectors with these coefficients, these interesting integers that we talked about before. And the genus H partition function is obtained by taking the delta function of this projector in power. And that's, by the way, the reason why powers of this thing appear in the formula I showed you before for the closed string partition function. But for now, what is important is that this, just this thing, you, you have pi, handle creation operator, it has this uh, expansion in projectors. So a very natural question is, okay, pi is a central element. It's an expansion in terms of, sorry, PR square should be PR, excuse me. Uh, so this form a basis for the center of the group algebra. And now I have a sum. So pi is, of course, a one-dimensional subspace. Natural question is, if I take powers of pi, what kind of subspace of the center of the group algebra do I get? And the answer is this. The powers of pi span a subspace which has a dimension d0. What d0 is the number of distinct values of the dimensions dr of these irreducible representations. And uh, the way to prove that is actually quite easy. Some of all ereps, you know, so some of these, some subsets will have the same dimension. So let R prime run over a set of ereps with distinct dimensions. And then for each erep, this pro sort of tilde projector sums the projectors for all the representations which have that erep dimension. So that, that's, I hope that's clear. So now I've written pi in a way where it is a sum of orthogonal projectors with coefficients which are all distinct. And whenever you have such a thing, an expansion of uh, some element in a commutative algebra where all the coefficients are distinct and these are all orthogonal projectors, then there's a formula for each of these orthogonal projectors in terms of pi. You have to take pi minus these guys divide by that guy. So basically, you can get all these projectors from powers of pi. These are just powers of pi, some combination of powers of pi. So therefore, you can span. Uh, that proves this theorem, basically. We picked this up from a math paper, which we refer to in the, that, that fact about projectors, which we refer to in the paper, in the first paper. So, so let d0 be the number of distinct values of the dimension as r is ranging over the ereps. Now look at this partition function, this one, one boundary and any number of handles. You're going to get, uh, that's just what the answer is. It's this normalized character that I talked about before. Sorry, I changed notation here for you. d sub r and d mar are the same thing. Uh, so anyway, it's g square over dr square, power h minus 1, and then you have these guys. Again, this is sum over all ereps but it is convenient to separate it as a sum over a set of ereps with distinct dimensions. So these are all distinct numbers now. And for each of those values of the dimension, I sum over all the representations which have that dimension. So this is going to be chi r tp over dim r prime, in fact. Uh, so, so there are these, these sums here. So this prime sum is over uh, a maximal set of ereps which have distinct dimensions. And the sum over these guys is over sum of a distinct irreducible representation with the same dimension. Or you can call this a, a direct sum of 
This is now a reducible representation. Anyway, so now you have this kind of equation. This is combinatorial data, products of group elements and such. Uh, this is something of interest. And uh, here you have these coefficients. So the way to look at this is to say that I have a vector uh, labeled by H. I have a matrix labeled by R prime and H. Uh, and I have another vector labeled by R prime. And we, we're going to, it is of interest to look at H from 1 to D0, so the number of R prime uh, is also 1 to D0, it's the number of distinct dimensions. Uh, and so, so R prime by definition goes over this number of different values, so we take uh, H to also go over that number of distinct values. So as a result, this will be a square matrix. It is of the form of a van der Mond, so distinct integers with different powers. Van der Mons of that kind are invertible. So therefore, you can uh, invert it, uh, express, so we, we have these delta functions, combinatorial data, van der Mond times x, which are these normalized characters. Therefore, you can invert it, invert this van der Mond and express these guys in terms of the combinatorial data. So, I mean, as you expect, you, you are not able to recover everything about the characters because these handle operators know about a subspace only. So you can only get partial sums. But a nice corollary of this is some integrality properties. So because this van der Mond is made from integers, as we said before, uh, it is a known fact that these guys are integers. These are powers of integers. So the van der Mond is made of integers. The inverse is rational. So therefore, uh, when you write a formula for you know, the x's in terms of the y's, you can get a rational numbers multiplying these things, which are also rational numbers. So therefore, you know that this is rational. Right? So, so you're going to have inverse matrix made of rational numbers. These are rational numbers, so these entries of that will be rational. But we also said that these things, the characters, the, the normalized characters, are algebraic integers because they solve an, a polynomial equation with uh, integer coefficients. So now combine these two facts that e algebraic integers, which are also rational, are actually integers. So we learned that these guys uh, are actually uh, integers. So that's the first integrality result that we have found. Sums of normalized characters over ereps of fixed dimension dr prime are integers. Where the, by the normalized characters, this this reducible rep. I'm summing over all the reps, ereps with a fixed dimension. Uh, another nice thing follows from this. So we're summing over all the ereps which have a fixed dimension, the same as our prime. Uh, that's the size of the conjugacy class. This is dr. But these are dimensions which have the same dimension as our prime. So this is dr prime. So I can just pull this out. So now I get this sum of characters. Uh, is, uh, this is integer, so this is therefore rational. But it's also known that the characters themselves are algebraic integers because there are simple reasons from group theory to know that. And therefore, this is also an algebraic integer. And from this property, it follows that these sums are algebraic are, are, are integers. So, and, and just to show this is all very concrete, uh, take the character table of uh, uh, just some, you know, group of, uh, some table of finite group character tables, you pick up something. So the characters themselves don't have to be integers. Some of them are, some of them aren't. But if you look at, these are the lists of dimensions. So look at the value dimension one. There's only one. That, was, that theorem before says uh, this has, all these numbers have to be integer. Uh, there, but there are two places where the dimension is three. So if I sum over that for any other column, I must get an integer from that theorem I just described. And if you take this plus root 5, minus root 5, 1 half plus 1 half, you get 1, uh, and so on. And for other 
dimensions which have multiplicity one, there's only one representation which has that dimension, these values must be integer as they are here. So it just follows from that theorem that this property I just described, the sums of characters, entries of the character table, when I'm summing over representations which have uh, a complete set of representations which have a given value of the dimension, that must be an integer. That follows by taking combinatorial data from TQFT and uh, uh, e using that to get the characters and just using elementary number theory, exploring the implications of that. So that's that. So uh, so how, how much time do I have? 10 minutes, 13 minutes? Eight. Oh, eight minutes, okay, <laughs> right, <laughs> very good. <laughs> so, so, good to know. Uh, so, okay, so partial sums along columns of character tables. Uh, uh, we have so shown that, uh, ah, so, so there I was using one CP conjugacy class and then any number of handles. I could also put sort of one handle and then one, one copy of this P conjugacy class and any number of CQs. Uh, you get analogous things, one handle, any number of Qs, and then one P. You get these power sums, which will lead to a Vandermon. You can invert that. And if this happens to be a column of the character table, which is all integers, then the same kind of argument goes through. So I was staring at the dimensions and picking up equal values. I could just pick up any column and look at equal values and then do these partial sums. I could even do, take the dimensions and a, another column, another conjugacy class, equal values of this pair and these refined sums, and you'll get integers by this kind of constructive argument. So I won't spell this out. Now, row sums. So to start thinking about row sums, let's just stare at these identities, which are again classical group theory. If you take this sum over these normalized characters, over all reps for a given conjugacy class, it's expressed in terms of this delta function, sorry, this should be TQ, TQ, TP, where it's the same P, so this should be P. And uh, if you take a sum for fixed representation, but you sum over the uh, conjugacy classes, it's in terms of fusion coefficients. So that suggests we should be thinking, if you want to do row sums, we should be thinking about uh, topological field theory where we have the fusion coefficients. So we can, topological field theory in two dimensions is basically a Frobenius algebra. So you have to define it, specify a basis for your algebra, some structure constants, pairing, and so on. So here's a sort of element of my algebra. I call it AR, AS. Uh, and I multiply them using the fusion coefficients. In this algebra, you can find projectors. So projectors, just like it was interesting to think about two bases before, the TPs and the projectors PR, now there's the ARs and the projectors AP. So now in this algebra, projectors are labeled by uh, conjugacy classes. And you can write a formula. So sum over these ARs with the characters. You can prove these form orthogonal projectors, and they also form if you take these ARs and multiply them by these uh, class labeled projectors in this dual algebra, you get characters. Not normalized characters of the kind I defined before, just the characters. That's just what comes out. So ordinary characters come out. Uh, and there is a handle creation operator. Just like uh, before, uh, we had sum over PRs with G over DR square. Now we have sum over uh, conjugacy classes. This is the size of the automorphism group of that conjugacy class. So the number of group elements which obey G, G1, G inverse equals G1. G1 is in your conjugacy class. So, so that, that, that size of that automorphism group, and that's an element which is the genus handle creation operator. And uh, essentially you can do various, all the analogous things. You can prove for example, that if you, by looking at higher genus surfaces with a fixed representation R, so now the boundary observables are these representation labels. You can put any number of uh, uh, boundaries with another fixed, another particular representation S, and then uh, 
you analyze these partition functions, you have an integrality condition, just because these are higher genus things obtained by gluing three-hole spheres, the three-hole spheres are fusion coefficients which are integers, you glue them together and sum, this is going to be an integer, so you have integer data here, uh, and you have van der Mons which you invert and you get very analogous results. So the details are in the papers, I don't have time to dwell on it. So, so then I'll just kind of get to the outlook and conclusions. So this is a well-known fact, you know, the, the row sum is an integer and, and this positive integer is uh, something of interest in complexity theory and combinatorial representation theory. For example, you know that is a positive integer for Sn, uh, although some of the entries could be positive or negative. Uh, one question is, is there an efficient combinatorial construction for this positive integer for Sn? How efficient is it if, if there is one? And so on. So what, one of the things we're learning is that for any group, this row sum, uh, which is always a positive integer, uh, but for a general group, the entries are not generally integers. But what we're learning here is that that p positive integer can be written as a difference you know, of, of positive integers. Essentially, there are positive and negative contributions from these partial sums. And you can take this integer and uh, do this kind of analysis. Take the, the row of interest you're summing, take all other rows, all other rows, pick the ones which are integer, and then look at the level sets of the rest of these integer guys, and then sum over these level sets, and then there are integers you're going to get from this theorem that we described. So, take, so there's a natural way to write this as, and, but these you know, partial sums could be positive or negative, so there is a natural splitting of this positive integer that exists for any row of any finite group in terms of something which is positive and negative, and it itself has a partition that depends on uh, level sets of the rest of the integer, column, integer rows. So there's an interesting structure in something of, very, of interest in combinatorial representation theory and complexity. So that's uh, what I've just said. So in the first paper, we were looking at digraph witten theory, which is all expressed in terms of irreducible representations. If you do twisted digraph witten theory, the formulae are known, especially my collaborator Eric Sharp is an expert on these things. <coughs> Delta function on group, with group elements and the co-cycle factors inserted, the sums that can be done, they're combinatorial. Right-hand side is expressed in terms of G over DR, where they are a projective representations, as we heard in Thomas's talk. So projective rep irreducible representations appear, and you can do analogous integrality results uh, in that case. And uh, in the third paper, you know, so we revisit, actually in the third paper is where we talked about this duality. Uh, and, uh, but we also in that third paper, because some of my younger collaborators are experts on Galois theory applied to string theory and so on, so the more standard approach to integrality properties of finite group character tables is based on Galois theory. And uh, for any finite group, there's a minimal integer e called the exponent, such that g to the e equals 1 for every group element. And therefore, the Galois extension of the rationals by e to the 2 pi i over e, which is called a cyclotomic field, can be used to study uh, you know, character tables. or There's a Galois action on character tables. And that's how usually one would approach integrality properties of character tables. Nevertheless, we hadn't found these precise partial sum integrality results in the literature. So we did you know, prove it using the Galois methods in that paper, recovered these guys. But some of the results we got from the Galois methods, we haven't yet got from the constructive methods. So the interplay between the Galois methods and the constructive TQFT methods will be interesting to study. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, as a physicist, better understand this duality between G flat TQFT and G fusion TQFT. You know, physicists are very concrete. You know, if you have a duality, what's the duality map between the variables? What are the duality invariant observables? So you want to very concretely understand the map between these two things. Also, as a physicist, can we extend this? You know, so this was all about the center of, of the. This was all about the center of the group algebra. It's about the fusion ring. Uh, can we extend from the center to the full group algebra? And maybe by thinking about the center, we derive some properties of the characters. Can we now derive something about the more refined data, which is the matrix elements? So that's an open question. I don't have a very good idea about it, uh, but one should think about it. 
so just to give the context from my po point of view on these kind of constructive algorithms for rep theory questions arising using so basically what we've done some constructive algorithms you know take this van der Mon inverted blah blah uh, which approach the construction of integers from rep theory here the co constructive algorithms came from lattice to QFT fusion to QFT uh, but this broad idea of using physics objects to construct things uh, is also relevant to more refined aspects of representation theories such as Littlewood Richardson coefficients and Kronecker coefficients and this is how, uh, how Joseph and I started to get into this business uh, and uh, there in that paper bipartite ribbon graphs play an important role which we know and love from large n matrix models and so on also integrality played an important role and more recently in what we're investigating uh, sort of uh, there are very interesting questions on uh, classical and quantum complexity of these algorithms associated with chronicle coefficients uh, which raise some very precise questions about symmetric groups so there's a lot of experts here so I'd be interested to discuss some of these things either afterwards or, or you know um, by email or something there are very interesting symmetric group questions that arise when you start looking at the complexity of all these algorithms that we are thinking about so I'll stop here Questions? Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Did you try to think about 3D uh, quantum double, double doubles? Yeah, no, so... Perhaps uh, since the actions are a little bit a lot of... No, so we haven't, we haven't uh, thought about that. Uh, it's a very thing, good thing to think about. Is, is there any particular... I guess what would be the, with the, the goal of the... I don't know. There's yeah. too many three-dimensional manifolds here. So yeah, yeah, that's true. Yes. That's a good point. Yeah. Because here it was we were organizing, organizing things in terms of genus. Yeah. So, yeah. One can always pick classes of things, you know. Here we get to like states on the circle and torus get a set to the action as people discuss. That's true. Yeah. 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 No, so that would be interesting. Yeah. Which just contains character tables and much more. Yeah. 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 Thank you. More questions? Um, do you have any, you know, Stanley problem as we know it? Yeah. It's about the raw sums of yeah of character. Didn't you find anything about you know partial raw sums? You know. So so we found partial raw sums. You know, integrality condition. So the Stanley, there's a Stanley problem, which is uh, essentially that, you know, so this identity I had. So chi r for a given conjugacy class uh, was also written in terms of sum of a fusion coefficients. So for that reason, you know that this sum is positive. Uh, so one of his problems is to say, well, you're summing over entries. Some of them could be positive, some of them could be negative, but you know they will end up being positive. Whenever you, you have uh, positive quantities like that, one question is, is there something constructive, like, like such as the little word Richardson? So some s simple thing that you could concretely do and hopefully do fairly efficiently uh, and then get that, just that positive integer directly. So that's one of his problems. So what we are saying is, we're not adding anything new to that, we're just saying that that integer of interest has some, ra some further fine structure. The partial sums in there which are positive, partial sums there which are negative, and the integer of interest is obtained from, uh, it has a sort of a more hidden structure. So we're not addressing that question, but we're giving more information about these positive integers of interest there. So you and there are analogous things for column sums. Yeah. yeah, so you do have, you know, uh, the row sum, this, uh, you express the row sum in terms of differences of two, Constructible things? Can well, we haven't. Well, okay. So what you call? No, not really, because what goes into these partial sums are the characters. Mm. And for a general group, we don't know a construction. Yeah, let's think about SN. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the SN case, you know, these are in that case, these are all integers. So the the only thing is that some of them are positive and some of them are negative. Mm. Uh, because I'm saying this because this would mean that it would be in gap P, you know, the, diff the, clo the, the closure of sharp P, you know, so that yes. would be already, I don't know if somebody addressed the raw sum as 
being a sharp pe- a gap pe- problem. So that would be a yeah. Problem. Well, okay. My, my impression is that to to uh, to say that precisely, you really have to give an algorithm that directly gives the integer of interest. Uh, and you have to know whether what the, something about the complexity of that algorithm or the verification of that yeah. and so on. So uh, there's something to think about there. But for, for the first instance, we're just giving some refinement of these properties, of these integers, positive yeah. integers. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Or, or maybe just some yeah. other stupid question. Yeah. If, I don't know. Is, even for symmetric group, is a bijective proof like n factorial is equal to sum of squares? Oh, a bijective proof. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that, that's some classical Young diagram stuff. Yes. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 But this is a very interesting class of questions, you know. Yeah. 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 Is that what you're working on? If uh, instead of delta g being equal to one whenever g is uh, identity, you have delta equal to one whenever g is a more, um, is a root of unity times the identity? Uh, no, the, the starting point, you know, the, 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 it's a bit simpler than that, I think. Uh, the starting point was simply, let's say, let's say, call, I'm looking at genus h partition function, uh, genus h, let's say, h handles. I take g1, h1, g2, h2, up to g, h, h, h. Uh, I look at g1, h1, g1 inverse, h1 inverse, uh, up to g, h, 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 g, h inverse, h, h inverse. So I take every possible 2h tuple of group elements, and I just take this product. And each time I get one, I c- c- add a one. And then I add all the ones and I get that number. Yeah. That's the input in, in the first algorithm. This kind of played a role in, in the sort of Galois stuff at the very end, not directly. Yeah, sorry, my question was maybe not. Okay, okay. sorry, maybe I didn't understand it. Yeah, it's, the question is whether if instead of adding one whenever you have uh, g equal to being uh, g equal uh, being equal to identity have g being equal let's say i i, I take uh, and oh i see you want to define this and then i take function. Uh, nth root of unity oh you want to delta i see you want to say the, you want to put an nth root of unity here yeah i want to count those uh, those elements instead yes do you have uh with, is your theory uh, quite adaptable to those kind of problems or not? uh Phases of this kind show up in this twisted digraph written, but I don't know if this precise question that you're asking, you know, just changing the one by this, whether that uh, precise question has an interpretation in TQFT. And the other naive question is, uh, can I uh, easily deform your counting uh, function? So instead of taking delta, let's say I have like a q to the power of an integer. Well, w- one, one deformation that comes up uh, is that, you know, so if you take the SN case, um, replacing this by the Hecke algebra, that does come up. Uh, in, in fact, part of the reason for interest in things like this in, in string theory has to do with the fact that SN, uh, SN stuff like this comes up when you are look, looking large N expansions of 2D Young Mills theory, for example. Uh, so UN, SN, Schuval duality leads to formulae like this for the partition, fu- for the one over n expansion of these partition functions. And then if you replace this by e- this UN by U- Q deformed, there are known formulae for the partition functions there, and you get expressions like this. So it hasn't been explored much from this kind of combinatorial rep theory point of view, but there, there are some data, some interesting formulae yeah. there. And what about QT? Th- that I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't even know if there are nice generalizations of this formula. But but even for this one, you know, exploring the group, the-, the the algebra and the rep theory side and learning something from it, I think is also an interesting question. Questions? Thank you. Thank you.